beautiful state, and I'm really honored to be here. I make it sometimes, actually very close to here, to uh, down in Elliott. Uh, a couple of times a year, I try and make it there and uh, across the state. Uh, a couple of times I've been lucky enough to, to go up and down. So just a gorgeous place. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you about, really, I think, an issue that, that is widely misunderstood among the general population. I know all of you uh, work day in and day out on this issue, uh, whether it's prevention, treatment, or enforcement. And I just think, first of all, what a wonderful testament it is to the coalition, Sally, and your team, all the groups that have put this, uh, this group together, only because here we have prevention, treatment, and enforcement, and uh, policymakers as well, uh, sitting around one table. Which is, which is nice, and I think in our field we don't, we don't see that as often as we should. Uh, in fact, I'm in this field because of a prevention coalition that started in my community where I grew up, way out on the other side of the country in California, um, some 18 years ago, and it was a prevention coalition that worked very closely with the local treatment provider, which in turn looked, worked very closely with the county sheriff, uh, who actually started the first prevention enforcement treatment partnership way before there were even coalitions almost 20 years ago. So uh, I, I just firsthand thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart about what you do and what, every day, even if it doesn't get all the accolades that it should. Um, Definitely, this topic is not an easy one to discuss. I, you know, in terms, especially my argument about it in my discussion is that we need a more nuanced conversation about marijuana in this country. That often people bring with them their own experience, whether it was, um, you know, uh, uh, smoking in a dorm room 30 years ago, and that that's the same experience as most kids have today, or um, you know, whether it's uh, maybe a, a horrible tragedy that started as a result of somebody using marijuana and then maybe going on to another drug. It's difficult sometimes to sift through the anecdote and actually look through the data, and that's what I'd like to do with you all today. And, and we're going to touch on numerous issues regarding marijuana, starting with some of the prevalence issues and just kind of where we are, an overall picture in the state and the country about marijuana. Then we'll move over to the policy issues and, um, and talk about the policy issue that Frankly, we're going to be talking about a lot more in this country, I think, which is whether it's legalization. Of course, you already have an experience here with medical marijuana. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you at the end kind of about a proposed way forward. And this is something that um, uh, the group Project SAM that you have some information, I think, in your packets about smart approaches to marijuana. That's a group that was just formed less than two months ago, in fact, um, with myself and Patrick Kennedy. And, uh, you know, the idea with SAM is to have that nuanced conversation and to kickstart really evidence-based discussions in this country regarding marijuana, which, again, is widely misunderstood. So just to go through some of the facts, I'm not going to read bullet by bullet, but you know, bottom line is today, of course, we have a far fewer marijuana users than we did 40 years ago. And we peaked in this country in the late 70s uh, with our marijuana use among kids, uh, whether it was daily, monthly, or yearly smokers. We saw a major reduction until about the early to mid-90s, and then we saw an increase in marijuana use, which then we again saw a reduction in the 2000s, but since 2007, we have seen an increase in marijuana use, about 2006, 2007. And um, that's been steady every year among kids. In fact, now more high school students, um, according to one survey, smoke marijuana cigarettes than tobacco cigarettes, which is really a remarkable finding. Um, that they did that also 40 years ago, but, but uh, other than that, at that time when we had the height of marijuana use, which was even higher than it is today, there, that has not happened in this country previously. Um, right now we're at about 23, almost a quarter of 12th graders uh, who are regular marijuana sm smokers in the country which is uh, pretty high, actually, if you think about it. Even, you know, we're at 18% in 2007. That's a major, uh, it's a 20% increase. Now, relative to, with our, if you look at our general population, 12 and older, uh, marijuana use is still far lower than our legal drugs. Um, in fact, so this 6.9% is part of the 87 uh, so obviously marijuana is about 90% of the illicit drug consumption in this country comes from marijuana. Um, so if you isolate that 6.9 though and look at, you know, compared to 52% of Americans who regularly drink and about 27% of Americans who regularly smoke cigarettes, it's obviously still much, much lower than those two drugs. So I think it's important to look at them in perspective. Um, th uh, uh, just to note, this 27% is a 15% uh, uh, increase in terms of the rate of increase 
um, than even three years ago for c tobacco cigarettes. So that's something interesting to watch because we have seen public health successes, obviously, among kids for reduction in tobacco. This was what I was talking about earlier with 12th grade use being an all-time high in 1979. I mean, we think about the 70s. We think about what kind of, kind of discussions were going on in this country. We had 12 states that decriminalized marijuana in a matter of four years. We had a major ascendancy of, of pro-marijuana interest groups really in Washington. Uh, and so we, we had that, you know, there was a lot happening, I think, that contributed to that increase. But then, like I said, we had that reduction, then another increase, then a reduction, then now we're kind of coming back, uh, back up again. We'll see kind of where it takes us. Um, but, but we are seeing um, a, certainly a major shift in attitudes, which is driving the shift in use. I mean, that's what you all know sort of drug policy prevention treatment 101 is attitudes predict future use. So that's a, that's a real problem. Now we look at Maine um, and we look at, so we have data for young adults and then we have data for uh, the 26 and older. Um, so, I mean, this, this more or less mirrors the, US, the national average here in Maine. I mean, we, we saw an increase though, uh, that's a 30% that's a increase in the matter of two years among the general population, which we also saw a 20% um, increase at that time um, among 18 to 25 year olds between 07, 08, 08 and 09. But there has been reductions recently. So I think it's sort of too early to tell whether this increase was an anomaly or whether it's part of a general uh, increase that we're going to see. We're going to have to follow that. When you look at the overall trend of 8th, 10th, and 12th graders combined, which I think is, is what's important to look at, you, you do see the same thing as I said before, which is still marijuana is a little bit harder to get according to kids themselves uh, who report that. Of course, that's self-reporting too. So remember, 8% of kids in that survey also say that they take a drug that does not exist. And so researchers have to account for that. So we all have to remember about self-report survey. More or less for trends, they're helpful, but we, gotta be, we shouldn't just use that as the only marker for our data here. That's okay. <laughs> Good. You should. Eight percent of kids use it. Um, so, you know, we have seen an increase in, in kids both in the state and the county. Again, these are traditionally a little bit higher than the state that think regular marijuana use is not harmful. And that trends with the rest of the United States in terms of, as I was saying, in over the last four years, uh, more and more kids that think it's not harmful. So why, do, why does it matter to kids? in the first place. So we'll shift a little bit to talk about the biology. I mean, the bottom line is that, you know, as you all know, the adolescent brain is becoming who it will be the rest of its life up until age 25. Let's put it that way. I mean, yes, that you can learn how to swim after age 25. That's possible. So your brain can learn something new and it can expand in a certain region in that way. But we all know it's much harder to learn how to swim after 25 than it is younger. We know it's harder to learn how to, you know, a foreign language uh, later in life than earlier in life. And that's because we, the scientists now know that the brain is what we call priming, is pruning. It's becoming, like I said, who it will be the rest of its life up until that age. And when anything is introduced to the adolescent brain, I mean, whether it's a good memory, a bad memory, um, something that you associate with somebody, uh, a substance, that can affect that brain for the better or worse. Um, and so what scientists now know is that marijuana does affect kids for the worse. Um, and if you start using in adolescence, you are much more likely to become addicted to the drug than if you started, if you waited let's say until after your age 21 to start using or 25 to start using. Um, and what's a, what's a sort of a primary example of that is the most recent um, study that just came out a couple months ago that I think is the most important study on uh, marijuana and learning outcomes that we've really had in about 25, 30 years, really since scientists identified that marijuana hurts learning. I mean, sort of made that first identification of that receptor in the brain um, that, that we know uh, uh, reacts to marijuana. I think this is the next most important study. And this was basically a study that the fourth largest city in New Zealand um, <coughs> recruited every single person born in the years 1970 and 1971 and they essentially recruited them for sort of the uh, researchers, I mean, ultimate dream, which is a longitudinal population level study. In other words, they're going to study an entire population over their entire life. 
um, and look and see what happened to them depending on different activities they took part in or just, I mean, all kinds of, you can imagine the amount of research questions that you can ask an entire population. So they have this fourth largest city, Dunedin, New Zealand, for these two birth, birth cohorts. And they basically check in on them every 8 to 10 years. So 8, 16, 24, 30, now 38. Okay, it was the last time they checked in on this cohort who is now you know, 42, 43. Um, and essentially, one of the things that they look at, obviously, is intelligence and, and substance abuse and, and all different kinds of things. And they were startled, as I think everybody was, um, at such a dramatic finding that they found, which they have now, by the way, reviewed over five or six times in different peer-reviewed journals based on other researchers questioning what they were saying. But basically, every single time it's been confirmed that essentially um, people who smoked marijuana in adolescence, they called it heavy persistent smokers, which they defined as basically um, a couple of times a month consistently for about two to three years on minimum, okay? So different way, that, that that's sort of the, the abbreviated version of how they, they define that. So a couple of times a week, I should say, over a two to three year period. And they found that uh, even if they stop using after age 21, I believe was the cutoff, um, that by age 38, so now that, because this is the last time they've checked in on them, the 38-year-olds who are the heavy persistent users in adolescence, even when controlling for abstinence, um, had a reduction in IQ and in their intelligence quotient by eight points on average, which, you know, if you know the IQ scale, eight points is, of course, is enough to take you from the top one-third in the world in IQ to the bottom one-third. And that's a big, big, big significant difference, eight points in the IQ scale. And um, so that was a major, major finding that, that confirmed what a lot of scientists have been talking about for a long time, about how, how marijuana especially affects um, the parts of the brain that are responsible for that kind of functioning, for mainly learning and memory. Yeah, the question about it? Well, I'm just curious. Sure. Already, does an average person's IQ that has not smoked marijuana still have the same? Yeah. So they, so they controlled for all of the usual factors, whether it's the normal kind of would your IQ drop from 21 to 38, um, which I think the answer is no, but um, on average. But anyway, they controlled for every single, I mean, they controlled for other drug use. They controlled for income. They controlled for your educational attainment. They controlled, so all of those things were controlled for, and that's why they're able to make this kind of sweeping conclusion. Obviously, if the culprit was you know, something else like socioeconomic status that would stick out. And in fact, some researchers used a computer simulation to challenge these mo this model and say that you didn't look at socioeconomic status. And <laughs> these researchers went back and they said, no, we did look at socioeconomic status. In fact, we confirmed this in, in rats and mice, because of course you can teach rats and mice things. They have an IQ and you can Obviously, they, you know, they are a good laboratory for that. And it was kind of funny because at the end of their, their response to the article, they said, you know, the last time we checked, mice did not have a socioeconomic status um, and, and yet still displayed the kind of results they found in humans. So it, obviously, it's, a, it's the first kind of major, um, you know, in terms of IQ over time because there just aren't these studies that are around. The first time we've identified this, we obviously need to explore it more, but it, it raises interesting questions about the adolescent brain. So I talked about one in six kids um, who use in adolescence will become addicted. And, you know, how does that compare? And I think I had, there's a slide later about how that compares with other substances and other activities. But, you know, I have students and I talk to kids often about this and they say, well, one out of six really isn't a big deal. I mean, you know, that means five out of six get away with it. Um, that's true, but think about it in, in the, no, that's, that is true, but thinking about, think about it relative to other activities that we consider very harmful. So one in four people get addicted to heroin, whoever started. I mean, uh, three out of four people get away with it. Now, we don't, in terms of their addiction, that they do not develop an addiction. And it's not because they died from an acute episode. It's because they stopped using. Most people who use any substance um, other than alcohol, they use it once and they stop. And that includes heroin. Um, and so they stop. Now, the other statistic I put out there for, for students and others to think about is, uh, you know, what do you think the chances are uh, if you're drunk, okay, legally drunk, above .08, and you get into a car, that you're going to kill somebody on the road? 
And, and usually students respond to me, well, I mean, you know, we know we shouldn't do that. So 80%, you know, 8 out of 10, you know, that would be, um, you know, an 80% chance or maybe 60% chance. I mean, some of the more conservative ones say maybe 1 out of 10, 10%, you know, because killing, obviously, that's a, that's a, that's, that outcome is an extreme outcome. The answer is 1 out of 300 times do people who are drunk and on the road kill somebody. Now, we don't obviously want to throw that stat around and tell people that it's one out of 300, you can take your chances, um, because we, that's just not good public health policy making. Um, but it puts into perspective one out of six. And remember, this outcome is also one of the more extreme outcomes for marijuana. I mean, that, you know, we're not only worried about people becoming addicted, we're worried about, we are worried about actually crashes on the road. And I'll talk about the data regarding driving, because more kids at the same time that they think marijuana is harmless, they think marijuana is safe to drive under the influence of. And that's a real problem when you look at the data, um, especially given the fact that marijuana is usually not used in isolation um, because it is used in, in relative to alcohol. So the British Medical Journal looked at every single study done on driving in marijuana and basically came to the conclusion that marijuana intoxication doubles your chance of a car crash. And again, I mean, we all, I mean, I, so many of us may know people who drive under the influence of marijuana, nothing happens, and, that, and again, that's fine. And I think a lot of times though that anecdote translates to the data, but when you look at the data, and BMJ also, the Annals of Epidemiology did the same thing. That Epidemiology Annals is one issue a year with their five best studies on anything having to do with epidemiology, and last year mirrored what the BMJ said about driving, which was that it doubles your car crash risk. That's obviously very problematic. The bottom line when I'm talking to parents and kids and others about this is that the marijuana smoke 30 or 40 years ago, again, maybe by your parents, you know, innocuously in the dorm, is not the marijuana of today. It is almost a completely different drug when you look at the composition of the drug. What do I mean? Well, we've all heard of THC content, which is THC is actually, in fact, let me see, here it is. THC is, is, is what gets you high, okay? That's why you get high, is from the THC. There's a receptor in the brain, it acts on it, and you feel that, that rush, okay? That's why, you're, that's why you get high. It produces a, a, you know, a addiction and withdrawal. There's definitely marijuana withdrawal. It produces all these things, and um, the, the THC content, though, in marijuana, I mean, this is only looking at back around 1982, was a, a, roughly 3 to 4 percent. Average now is roughly 10 to 11 percent, so that's already a four to five-fold increase. If you look at the marijuana of the 60s and 70s, though, we're looking at 1 to 2 percent. So I liken it to, you know, the marijuana smoked... 40 years ago, it's like you know, getting your hemp Whole Foods waffles and smoking the cardboard box that it was in. It was a, you're going to get about the same buzz um, if you do that. Uh, um, and, and, and that's, again, because it's just very, a very, very different drug. It's not only the THC we're worried about, by the way, because, of course, marijuana, and I'm going to talk about this when I talk about the medical aspects, because that's a controversial but interesting issue. Marijuana has over 500 components in the plant, because and about 100 known cannabinoids, in other words, things that act on the brain that we know about right now. There are probably things we have no idea about that's in there. Um, one of those uh, components is called CBD. So it's like THC, but CBD, cannabidiol. Cannabidiol is in the native cannabis plant, so when people say, you know, marijuana was, has been smoked for 5,000 years and it's part of cultures, etc. I mean, the marijuana smoked 5,000 years ago, even 40 years ago, had a good amount of CBD in it. That was the, that's a native part of the plant. You cannot find CBD in modern marijuana today. So the street marijuana does not have CBD in it. Why? Because producers and traffickers do not want a marijuana that doesn't get you high. And CBD takes the high away from you. This is important when we think about medical marijuana, and I'll talk about it in a little bit. But basically, um, you know, if a high CBD content plant means bad marijuana in terms of intoxication. So right now, the marijuana that kids are smoking are high THC, low CBD, and we don't even know about everything else. That's kind of the scary part about it. Um, and Kevin? Sure. Isn't the CBD the, the, the thing that they think also might help shrink tumors because yeah. I've had kids say, right. well, if you smoke that, yeah. it'll shrink t yeah. tumors. Yeah. So there's one study ever done with about a subject of four people, I think the N was. I'm not kidding. I mean, this, this is a, no. And this is amazing about the power of the internet, and I got to hand it to the power of the legalization lobby. They have been able to mobilize on the internet and get information to kids. I mean, 
you know, we're killing ourselves in prevention and treatment to do that, you know, or to come up with messaging. I mean, we were at ONDCP with a $5 million anti-drug media campaign that was $180 million 10 years ago. Still couldn't really figure out how to do it. And yet, <laughs> it's amazing that these, and i got to hand it to them, the how, how, how wonderfully organized and what a great propaganda machine. I mean, I say that in, in, in a good way for them, that they've been able to produce because you're right. I mean, it's amazing to me that kids will know these obscure studies, and yet we'll never hear about the British Medical Journal looking at 35 studies done over the last 20 years on marijuana and crashes. Um, or they will never hear about the IQ study, which has been covered in every single media outlet, but hasn't been delivered to them in a really in a digestible way at all, like these guys do. So to answer your question, though, even with this N of four, yeah, a lot of the things, and, and we'll talk about this when we talk about medical marijuana more, but yeah, I mean, CBD, which is a part of marijuana, ha does show some of these, for example, uh, tumor reduction properties in that one study, but also other studies that show positive results. Um, and that's fine. And I, and I sort of say, well, that is very different, though, than talking about the entire marijuana and the flowering buds, which has the THC and everything else in it, because it's almost like saying, um, you know, morphine has been shown to be ther have therapeutic potential, so let's inject heroin uh, or let's smoke opium. I mean, morphine comes from opium, um, but we don't smoke opium to get its effect. And I think it's the exact same thing with marijuana, but unfortunately politics, science, and everything else in between has gotten in the way of us having a rational conversation about, you know, quote unquote, medical marijuana, like we can about medical opium, because we have medical opium. I mean, that's again, that's what that morphine is. That's what all these opiates are. We have medical cocaine. It's not a problem. Um, and used in certain hospital settings. And we have, I mean, we can list dozens of pharmaceuticals that are deadly uh, and addictive, but can also be helpful, yet are delivered in a safe, you know, if taken for the intended purposes, safe, standardized, and recognizable format versus smoking the flowers of, of the marijuana plant, which is, which is not safe, recognizable, duplicatable, you know, dosage. We can't make a dosage from it, et cetera. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk more about that in a minute, but, but you were right about that. Um, anyhow, just to finish on the, the health part, the changes in the adolescent brain we know are memory problems, IQ loss, even less life satisfaction when you interview people you know, who have been lifelong marijuana smokers and control for all sorts of things, and you ask them, are you satisfied with your life now at age 45? Um, they're less likely to say they are versus people that didn't smoke. Um, the lung stuff is mixed. Well, we know that smoking anything is bad. So we know that bronchitis, for example, lung complications, phlegm production, all heightened with marijuana. Marijuana contains more tar than tobacco. We know all of that. We're only learning, though, about the risk for cancer. And I don't have a definitive answer because there really isn't one to say that marijuana causes lung cancer in the same way that we could say tobacco causes lung cancer. Now, that could either mean that it doesn't cause lung cancer for a lot of different reasons. I mean, you hold in marijuana longer. What does that do to the lung? And we're still looking into that. Or that could mean we're just where we are with marijuana. Um, we're at the same place today with marijuana that we were 50 years ago with tobacco when there was no definitive link. Uh, to lung cancer. I mean, we don't know about that. And that's, again, a lot of this with marijuana, but also really with all drugs, given, you know, n there's no such thing as like an instant addiction for 100% of the population. A lot of this is a, is a roll of the dice. So, yeah, I mean, you can make an educated guess, I guess, and roll the dice, but here's your chances for different things. You know, one in six for addiction, not bad. Doubles the risk for car crash, probably not good. I mean, all sorts of things that you have to take into account. Obviously, it's harder for kids to sometimes process all of that when it's about the immediate gratification. And when marijuana is not like cocaine and heroin in that it cannot produce an acute overdose immediately, it's not a scary drug like methamphetamine. Um, remember, by the way, tobacco does not produce an acute overdose either. I mean, you cannot smoke. You cannot, in one session, die from smoking tobacco cigarettes. Um, you hear that a lot from kids also about, you, can, you know, no one's ever died from marijuana. Uh, that's literally as accurate as saying no one's ever died from tobacco. Because it, what, what that means is, you, again, you cannot produce that acute intoxication at that time to produce, you know, cardiac you know, arrhythmia or, or a seizure that you can with cocaine and the opiates. Um, but obviously... A lot of people have indirectly died from both of those substances. Mental health is a huge issue that 
If you were to say this 40 years ago, you'd be screamed out of the American Psychiatric Association as crazy yourself. Um, but <laughs> they are now, in terms of what the science has done to look at the risk, mainly for schizophren schizophrenia, but also for uh, psychosis, and then to a little bit of a lesser extent, depression, because we're only learning about that now, and other uh, psychiatric problems. Uh, you know, we're still learning, yes, but about 15 years ago, the link to mental illness was established as very significant and very strong, according to researchers who have looked at this. So they've looked at, for example, a Swedish cohort of twins, where basically you have one twin that smokes, one that doesn't. Nature's the same. Uh, you control for the other stuff that happened in their life that's different. And you come out with the fact that the twin that smokes is more likely to uh, have schizophrenia than the twin who didn't smoke. Now, you can also say, was it the chicken or the egg? I mean, is it people are self-medicating because of their mental illness, or is it the mental is it the the drug that's causing mental illness? Scientists actually have found both directional directions in terms of the the causation or the the correlation. I mean, nothing's causation, but the correlation. And um, you know, right now, I think the consensus is that again, it's on both sides. It exacerbates mental uh, marijuana exacerbates mental illness. Mental illness, you know, may be a sign for marijuana use. Uh, later in life. So it's, it's, it's really on both sides. The bottom line is it's not good. Um, th I guess this is Dr. William McFarlane who's looked at the, the issues of mental health, uh, uh, mental illness, and, and marijuana and found different studies looking at how um, people are more resistant to getting treatment for mental illness if they're smoking marijuana, and I think that is true um, in terms of other studies that have been done. Um, now, just looking at the, the this is a, a scaled sort of circle graph that looks at addiction among, or dependence among different drugs. And so here we are, 12 and older with marijuana, followed by pain relievers, cocaine, tranquilizers, I mean heroin is tiny, and, and the other drugs. Um, this is the addictive potential that I was talking about earlier in terms of, now this is for adults, in terms of your chances of getting addicted if you try the drug once. That's basically in... Layman's terms, kind of the way to the way to interpret that. Now, tobacco is the most addictive drug we, we know of that we have. One in three people who try it will become addicted. Um, heroin, I said it earlier, one in four. That's right, about 25 percent almost. Um, cocaine is next, then alcohol, stimulants, and then here we have marijuana at nine percent, which is about one in ten or one in eleven really people. Um, you know, again, I don't know. Like, take your chances. I mean, not as bad as. As, as alcohol or cocaine, certainly not heroin or tobacco, about the same as stimulants and analgesics. I mean, you know, it's addictive. And, there, but, and so there is a sort of, unfortunately, a meme out there that you know, marijuana is not addictive. Um, but, you know, the research shows obviously otherwise. Um, what's interesting to look at actually about the addictive nature and the THC content that I was talking about earlier is we actually looked at two years of drug use, where drug use was actually about the same level in 93 percentage-wise as it was in 2007. Kind of very, very similar rates in terms of if you just take a snapshot of those two years. Then we looked at the treatment need in those years of, the, of those drugs. And what was striking is, well, first of all, you had a reduction in alcohol. You actually had a major reduction in cocaine, which and if you took that, this is 2007, if you take 2013, we'd probably be like half of that even. I mean, the reduction in cocaine is, the, is an untold good news story in this country over the last 10 years. It's remarkable, actually, to look at that. Heroin about the same, although now we see some increases because of now the subsiding of prescription drug abuse, which is a whole other issue entirely. But with marijuana, and if we look at 07 now, we'd, we'd be around here at, at 20%. This is about 8, 17%. But essentially, even though marijuana use has been about the same, Marijuana treatment over the last 20 years has m more than doubled. And again, people think probably the culprit is THC, uh, the, the fact that this is much more harmful than it was before, and the brain is more susceptible to high uh, degrees of addiction, high rates of addiction, when there are high rates of, of THC in the drug. So that's just an interesting, I think, snapshot and a way to look at, you know, what is the effect of THC. I wish I could say the increase in treatment is because there's more marijuana treatment out there. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think we can say that. So let's now get into the policy part of this, uh, moving away from the, from the bio part of it. Um, and I just wanted to um, 
make sure we're on the same page about definitions of terms because that, that can be very, um, you know, people throw out terms all the time without any kind of definition. Um, obviously, with legalization, we're talking about not only the removal of criminal penalties for use, but also for, for you know, use and possession, but also for sales, pr uh, production, distribution, and usually the state or somebody getting involved in sales and taxation, someone legitimate, sales, taxation, uh, other financial activity, et cetera. So it's really kind of the alcohol model, I guess we could say. Um, you know, there are some legal issues with legalization right now in terms of, you know, the U.S. is a signatory to, along with over 180 other countries, of international law that binds us to not legalize drugs, currently illegal drugs. Um, it's interesting, obviously, about what's going on in this different states right now. We have a Controlled Substances Act that unequivocally says that the, we have a federal law that says marijuana is illegal. Uh, however, the votes in Colorado and Washington are obviously challenging that. And, uh, you know, the administration, I think probably very soon, I'm guessing in the next few months, is going to is going to put something out about what their position is uh, regarding the, the federal law. But, I mean, it's, it's clear no matter what position you have or party, and I've worked for obviously this past administration, it's clear when you look at, uh, when you look at federal law, I mean, it's, it's, there's no question that, that a state cannot simply sell uh, marijuana legitimately and get taxation on it. That's what we would call sort of illegalese. That frustrates the federal law, and it works in direct contradiction to the federal law's explicit, um, not just intent, but what it says very, very, very explicitly, and what's been uphold, upheld in the Supreme Court numerous, numerous times. But it's very interesting political times to look to see how that plays out. Decriminalization is often thrown around with legalization, but it is not legalization. It simply means um, you can't produce, manufacture, sell, buy. You can't do any of that. But if you possess, um, basically, it's not, you don't have a criminal penalty, um, maybe a civil infraction or a fine. It varies very dramatically in, from different states. We actually have 12 states that officially have decriminalization, I think 13 now, that officially have it, including Massachusetts. Um, but really, we have de facto decriminalization in this country, just generally. I mean, you can't even dis distinguish, if you look at jail and prison statistics, between states that have decrim, technically, the 13, and states that don't. There's really no way to distinguish the who's in prison. People are not in prison for marijuana use only. Um, it's often a contributing factor, so it's like, you know, you... You know, you're driving 85 miles an hour in a 55, and you, or maybe if you're high on marijuana, you're driving 20 in a 55. <laughs> equally dangerous, by the way. I mean, you hear kids say, yeah, it's slow, it makes you drive slower. No, equally dangerous, 20 in a 55. Uh, but anyhow, and, you know, you have a busted taillight, you know, your registration you haven't renewed in three years, you know, you're emitting all kinds of, you know, gases into the air with your car, et cetera. Um, you know, you get pulled over, the policeman sees, you know, you don't have registration that, you know, there, you have some other thing you haven't paid, you have unpaid parking tickets, all of these things, and there happens to be a bong in your car or they see marijuana or whatever, yeah, you're going to be cited for marijuana. Um, but that marijuana is not, it, it's, it's really never the reason you would serve any kind of appreciable prison time or really even jail time. I mean, it might add a day, you know, to, uh, until your arraignment or something. But it's just we're not we're not really seeing. And I'll go through the data that marijuana alone is is causing people to stay in prison and even go to prison. Um, so, kind of ironically, with decriminalization, people say, "Well, we need to decriminalize marijuana, and that way we'll free up prison space." I mean, you really, you know, the argument would be made more for legalization of marijuana might free up prison space, although I would argue that that wouldn't even really work. But uh, decriminalization really wouldn't do that. Um, and, you know, again, like I said, it's legal under federal law because federal law simply says it has to be, you know, you can't basically, it has to be illegal. But your penalty for it being illegal can be zero dollars. I mean, Maine can say, well, it's illegal but we're going to give you a $10 ticket or we're going to give you some. And that, you know, the, the federal government, while it has a federal law, another legal, legal term, it cannot commandeer states to do a certain thing 
that it wants. The way we get away with it, I say we, I'm not in the federal government anymore, but the way we did get away with it in terms of seatbelt laws or drunk driving laws and, and the drinking age laws, so now everywhere is 21 versus 18 or whatever in some states, is that simply Congress said, yeah, great, you could do whatever you want in terms of your age. We know we can't tell you to make it 21, but we're not going to give you any highway funds, and we're in, we're in our <laughs> jurisdiction to do that. And they're right. I mean, they're legally, they don't give highway funds to whoever you want. And so they, they, that's how they made all the states change, was simply tie it to highway funds. So there are obviously political ways around it, um, but legally, they, you know, federal government also cannot tell you um, that the l drinking age is 21, for example. Um, so that's how, the way around it. Was there a question over here? Yeah. yeah. It's like a sale of marijuana. Yeah. It's yes. Criminal, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So how do you, you get it is the question. It. Yeah, you can't, usually you can't grow it. So the question is, well, great, I can have it in my pocket, but how do I get it? Um, it's illegal. It, I mean, decriminalization does not make sense intuitively in that way. And the Netherlands actually has really like a de, de facto legalization or a true decriminalization model. Because you actually can't buy it or grow it or, you know, you can't do anything in the Netherlands. But you can go somewhere and smoke it. But it doesn't tell you how to get it. It's, it's very schizophrenic. Talk about schizophrenia. It's very schizophrenic, uh, that kind of policy where on, you're sort of extremes on either side, opposites. Um, but anyway, I think it's a very unhelpful term because if you look at every single news article written about legalization in the last three years, I guarantee you 80% of them, and if there are any master's or PhD level students here and you want to get published, this is a good paper to do, do a, do a review of the media covering legalization and you'll find that 80% of articles say decriminalization and they use these terms interchangeably. Yeah. So it's, it's impossible to even know what decriminalization yeah, means. Yeah. People about Diane Russell's mm -hmm. um, bill oh, yeah. does that. It's mm -hmm. in the headline. Mm -hmm. It's over on the table. They use one term when they really mean the other. Yeah, clearly that bill is legalization. I mean, I think it's either lazy. I don't know. I still haven't figured out why that's the case. I think it's just laziness, like among everybody. I'm guessing that's why. I don't think it's malicious. I don't think people are trying to, you know, slip legalization under the rug by coding it and saying decriminalization. I don't know, maybe. But I think it's really, they think it means the same thing. Uh, it's, it's really ignorance, actually, more than laziness. Um, and then medical marijuana, you know, laws and ordinances that basically decriminalize marijuana for those who meet certain criteria according to state law for users and what we call caregivers, and they vary widely in implementation. I mean, you know, your medical marijuana here does not look like medical marijuana in Colorado or California. I, I don't know. I don't think I would say it's a model, um, and I'll tell you why I don't think it's a model. But I, it's very different, and so we see a very different versions all across the country. So here's here, you know, obviously Maine is targeted for legalization, and um, basically, as Sally just said, Representative Russell, should the legislature fail to pass it on their own, um, the Marijuana Policy Project, which is the main lobbying group in Washington and around the country for legalizing marijuana. It sort of started as a splinter off of Normal, which, I mean, have you guys heard of Normal, National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws? I mean, Normal's like the granddaddy of them, you know, been around since sort of Woodstock days and, you know, the hemp t-shirts and the, sort of the whole culture, the magazine, all that stuff. MPP basically said, you know, you've been at it for 30 years and we still don't have legal marijuana in this country. We're going to try a new tax. So really, I, like I'd like to say, and, and they wear this badge proudly, you know, they sort of traded in their hemp t-shirts for uh, uh, Alfani suits, cut their hair, and um, became very good spokespeople, I'm serious, for legalization. I mean, they're on the Hill lobbying, uh, very intelligent people. These are like for lawyers and others. I mean, they've, this is a professional operation. This is not about, you know, flip-flops and the whole culture. This is about that. And I, nothing against flip-flops, by the way, I'm from California. I love flip-flops. <laughs> but, um, but I think you understand what I was trying to say. So. Essentially, the Marijuana Policy Project has targeted Maine. They've targeted about half a dozen states over the next few years um, for their donors. And their, their founder brags that you know, he knows 23 rich guys that will write million-dollar checks like this. Um, and 23 million will do it in, in five or six states. It'll take a couple million in each state. Because um, what they do is they buy ad time a year before. I mean, this is a very strategic it's very, very strategic political plan. So they're going to introduce what they call tax and regulate initiatives. Notice they don't use the word legalization. Um, in 2014, leading to a potential statewide referenda in 2016. So they really see that, that locally they're going to go for these different cities. I think I just heard Portsmouth has been... Portland. 
uh, Portland, sorry, Portland has been uh, has been uh, targeted, and some other cities I think are being targeted. This is part of the process here that they've been very open and transparent about. A for transparency um, in, in talking about their their strategy. Um, but again, I. When I say they, I mean groups like Marijuana Policy Project, but also just the media and others. Unfortunately, um, they frame the legalization debate in a way that really, really, really benefits them, um, the people who want to legalize, because they've essentially framed it this way. That, and this is kind of where we transition into talking about Project SAM and what we're trying to do. Essentially, these groups have framed their messages uh, as legalization or incarceration. I mean, that's our two choices. Those are our two choices for marijuana. Now, anybody who knows anything, of course, as we said about incarceration, is that people are not in prison for marijuana use. I'll go over the stats in a bit. Um, it's really a false dichotomy to say that the only alternative to legalization is to throw everybody in prison. It's a great way to scare people, and it's a great way to make people who aren't in favor of legalization sound very unreasonable. And they've done a brilliant job at making many of us sound very unreasonable. Um, because they have basically said, these are our choices. So, you know, you're either with us or yes or no. That's what you're voting on, right? Yes or no. I mean, they're right. You are voting on yes or no. However, um, what I'm arguing and what Patrick Kennedy and, and people from the right as well, it's really a, a bipartisan coalition, are, are arguing is that that is really not a fair way to frame the debate. Um, they've also, well, okay, so legalization is a reality. It is gaining support every year. I mean, it, you know, it, let me tell you something. The anti-legalization folks, what, whoever they really are, um, completely outspent on this. I mean, many of the people who are against legalization are, and I get that the views are probably very diverse in this room, but I mean, by and large, the people that are against it come from folks who work in treatment, maybe work in prevention, um, you know, law enforcement. I mean, they have day jobs like you all. I mean, you all have day jobs. Um, so the idea that you're meant to like, go home at night and put on your... Carl Rove hat and become political spinster and organize and have all these wonderful plans and raise $23 million like this is ludicrous. And so um, really beyond people who actually work in the field, uh, you know, no one's really been persuaded to care about this issue, to be against it. I mean, you know, what's the big deal? Um, so they've just done a wonderful job at outspending whatever opposition there might be. There's also a huge messenger problem. I mean, in our field, we, you know, the people that would traditionally speak out against it really are getting older. They're not representing America today. In many ways, I mean, I, I look at the, and this isn't to get political, I've worked for Republicans and Democrats. Um, you know, in many ways, it, it sort of, in, in a sense, mir mirrors something like the Romney campaign. I mean, it's sort of like should be good, looks good, but in reality has not resonated with, you know, all these key voting blocks. And they don't, the campaign doesn't look like the people who are voting uh, for, that they want to vote for them. And I feel like in many ways, anti-legalization groups have suffered from that also in the past. Most of all, the factor I think leading to the increase in legalization is that legalization in the, especially, you know, they've totally reframed it. So it's tax and regulate, really regulation, which sounds much better than legalization, um, is seen and framed as a sensible alternative. I mean, it's like, you know, you're, it, it's sensible because we want to get a handle of this. We want to control it. It's not that much more harmful, if at all, harm, more harmful than alcohol. Uh, tobacco kills half a million people a year. When's the last time marijuana led to a death like that? Um, kids are doing it anyway. Let's at least get our hands around it and make some money from it. And then we can invest that money in prevention and treatment or, or whatever else you want to do. But let's, yeah, we all know that, that we've heard that one before. Um, the last time I checked, by the way, the lottery was supposed to save public education. I haven't seen what's been going on in Maine, <laughs> but yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so we're promised these things all the time. Let's keep that in mind. But anyhow, this is the promise. Um, and to a lot of people that, you know, they don't work in your field, they don't think about this that often. That sounds pretty good. I don't want to be, if I'm smoking one joint a year with my friends after work and I'm a 40-year-old you know, adult, you know, I don't want the cops to come bust down the door and arrest me, and then, which doesn't happen in reality, but it doesn't matter that it doesn't happen. Perception is reality. That is a perception out there, that people are being rounded up for, for using marijuana. Or I don't want my kid, my 21-year-old kid at you know, Oberlin College um, being <laughs> arrested uh, for smoking marijuana, if that's the only thing, and it'll destroy his whole life. Um, those are the arguments. And when you think about it like that and you don't know much about the issue, 
know, maybe it's worth a try. I mean, and I think that's what a lot of people are being sold. What I would argue, um, sort of giving away the, uh, sort of <laughs> my argument here, and, and we're not at the end yet, is that we do need a, a, what I would call a smart approach. Um, and that's what we at SAM are calling this. So this is not about legalization versus incarceration. Both of those alternatives are actually undesirable. I mean, we, and I'm going to go into why I think legalization is undesirable. Um, but also, we don't have the resources, nor do I think any law enforcement. I haven't seen, you know, met one person law enforcement who wants to use resources towards imprisoning um, kids for smoking marijuana. I mean, I, that's just not on anybody's priority list, let alone law enforcement. Um, so we don't need either of those, but we can be against legalization, but in favor of health, really education, common sense, civil liberties, um, you know, opportunities for, for everyone, even those who might have made a mistake and smoked marijuana in their life. I, you know, it's not that y if you're against legalization that, that you can't be in favor of any of those things. So we started Sam, which, like I said, you know, Ted Kennedy's son, Patrick, and I started a month, uh, two months ago in Denver. We were actually joined uh, on, so we, obviously he, no surprise, represents really the left. Um, and we were joined on the right by really, I mean, talk about unlikely bedfellows, um, by the guy, uh, his name is David Frum. You may not know his name unless you read Newsweek, and he's a columnist for Daily Beast and Newsweek. But you know the three words that he's most famous for, and everybody in America knows. And those three words are axis of evil. Um, he was the speechwriter for George W. Bush, uh, 2000 to 2003. He's a wonderfully articulate, whether you agree with him or not, very, very intellectual, articulate guy uh, who talks about a lot of these issues. Uh, in fact, he's taken some heat lately for um, being one of, sort of one of the few people amongst people in his, in his party to be in favor of gun control. Um, but essentially, other than really that issue of gun control and marijuana, um, Patrick and David couldn't disagree on, on more. I mean, they, they obviously disagree on a lot of things. Um, yet, they, they are both sort of coming together uh, around what we're calling a smart approach um, that, that really rejects either of those, like, that false dichotomy. The cool thing about what this is doing is there has been a, uh, unfortunately, a tendency for the medical field to really not get involved in this issue at all. Um, doctors and, and others, you know, unless you're sort of a specialist in addiction, but pediatrics, really, this is sort of a forbidden issue. It's like, I don't really want to talk about marijuana, not really sure where I stand. I know it's harmful, but maybe legalization will work. I don't know. Don't want to get involved, really, in this protracted shouting match, which has been the debate you can, you can argue has been, it's been characterized like that. And, but what Sam has been able to do, what this project has done, is actually bring people together, including physicians and public health folks, who normally would, would want to really stay as far away from this debate as possible. Because we are talking about the health consequences. And we're talking specifically about, you know, sort of the legalizers talk about regulation. We're talking about commercialization and the worry we have really about repeating the mistakes of the last hundred years with big tobacco. And I'm going to get into that in a second. Um, so essentially our four pillars. First is just to get the science of today's marijuana out to the American public. Just, just get this information out so that kids, the only thing kids know about marijuana isn't that four people in a controlled study who were given cannabidiol had a 10% uh, reduction in tumor growth, which is what, unfortunately, that's all people seem to, you know, kids are knowing about these days. But get out the message to parents as well. This is not your Woodstock marijuana. It's very different. It is a problem for, for kids. You can get addicted. We want to get that information out. Second, and this isn't to be, and I haven't talked about this today, but we're not, you know, it's not, not meant to, um, to diminish it. You know, we should have an honest conversation about the consequences, especially in underserved communities, uh, of our marijuana and really our drug policies generally. I mean, you know, it's no secret and there's no real way to argue around this that, you know, if you're a rich white kid smoking pot in your grandma's basement, you're much less likely to get apprehended by the criminal justice system than you are a poor black or Hispanic kid hanging out on the public housing stoop because you don't have a grandma's basement to, to, to do your activity in. Um, and, and so that's about a whole huge issue about socioeconomic justice and a whole host of things that we should have a discussion about in terms of what our policies, how they affect different populations. But unfortunately, that, for example, that has been used as a wedge to say, well, that's why we need to legalize marijuana, because there's this huge injustice, and you know, whites have more privilege, and so therefore, this is a reason. And I guess we would argue that it's not really a reason to legalize marijuana. It's a reason to talk about that issue, because it's a real issue. Um, but, but why would we make this leap 
Um, but again, they have very cleverly done so. Um, interestingly, they have not had a lot of um, support from underserved communities, because frankly, those are the communities that don't have the $50,000 check to write to the Betty Ford Clinic if the kid gets addicted. I mean, those are the communities that feel the brunt of addiction more than, frankly, probably folks in this room, because they, you know, that, that's unfortunately due to a lot of different circumstances. So actually, um, if you look at the composition of these groups, they have a very hard time reaching uh, underserved populations. But the way they do is sort of with this false bait about incarceration and, and how drugs play such a big role. The third uh, tenant, and this is the, one of the ones I like to emphasize in groups like this, is that we are, this is again not about regulation or even legalization. This is about what would happen as a result of legalization, which we argue is commercialization. Commercialization. Um, that we want to prevent big marijuana. Um, and that may sound like a dream now, but uh, we are still learning from our painful experience of over 80 years from big tobacco. I mean, these companies, and I'm going to go into some detail here because we actually did dug some of the evidence out, but these are companies that completely lied to the American people. They told kids that, uh, that uh, tobacco was harmless. They, they touted tobacco as medicine in the 1950s. You all, some of you might remember, um, you know, the advertisements, physicians prefer Pall Malls or doctors like camels. I mean, it's, we laugh now. It seems like a millennia ago. It wasn't. It was 50 years ago. <laughs> and as a result, we still have, given every single anti-tobacco law and campaign you could impose on that industry, we still have 27% of Americans smoking. We still have 500,000 people die a year, premature death as a result of, of, of their tobacco use, some long-term, some short-term tobacco use. And it's still a major drainer of healthcare dollars. And and I don't even know where you can smoke these days. I mean, it's illegal everywhere. I mean, if I, I don't smoke, but I mean, if I did in my house, my, definitely my wife would kick me out. I don't know where anybody can smoke these days without getting kicked out of their own house or being arrested um, or written up by somebody or told to leave. It's just not, but we still have a quarter of Americans doing it. I don't know where they're doing it, but they're doing it. Um, and, and we are only now learning that the tobacco industry not only knew all about the harms of, of tobacco, but essentially swept them under the rug and, and had their own studies financed, but we know that they deliberately targeted youth. I mean, these are the companies that under oath 15 years ago, 20 years ago said, well, we, you know, Camel was really not about kids. Um, you know, it was just brand identification for the adult population, responsible adults, 21 and over, to have the right to do this activity. I mean, it is exactly the same thing with marijuana. I mean, we are hearing the exact same arguments. This time it's not coming from an established industry. It's coming from a growing industry, I mean, medical marijuana, and we'll talk about the growing industry of marijuana. Um, but what I fear and what Project Sam really fears is that we're gonna go back and, and make the same mistakes we made with tobacco. Because unless somebody's gonna have a constitutional convention anytime soon and repeal the First Amendment, which I would argue on different grounds should not be repealed, um, <laughs> We are going to have commercialization. Commercial speech is free speech. The Supreme Court is, uh, has said that over and over and over and over again. Any attempt to curb industry is extremely difficult. I mean, it took a gargantuan effort to curb tobacco. Although, I'll tell you, I was in Ohio two days ago, and in the lobby of the hotel where we had the marijuana meeting with a 1,000 preventionists, law enforcement, and treatment, there was a huge, and I couldn't believe my eyes. I thought it was a, like a part of a museum, but it was actually, people used it. There was a huge vending machine. For, to, for tobacco cigarettes. I thought those were illegal. I mean, I, clearly they're not. Um, and I, I literally thought this was some kind of like exhibition about you know, traveling back in time. Um, I mean, I was in central Ohio. I figured, oh, no, this was the reality in central Ohio, uh, unfortunately. Um, so I mean, the idea that we're going to get rid of that is, is impossible. And then the fourth pillar is really to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the medical issue, which I'm going to talk about uh, at the end. We talked about the establishment of, uh, of, of the public health, getting into, getting into the effects of legalization. We hear all the time that if only we treated marijuana like alcohol, we'd have less people arrested. Fewer involvement in the criminal justice system, and it would be wonderful. Well, I looked at how many people are arrested for our legal drugs, alcohol mainly, um, in 2008. It's the same thing last year. The, the, the data hasn't changed that much. And to my surprise, no, I set aside, we set aside all of the violence related to alcohol, because I'm not here to argue that 
you know, alcohol-related violence is the same thing as marijuana-related violence. Don't even need to go there. Take all of that out and look at just the effect of legalization of alcohol. So that means when you legalize alcohol, you have laws regarding who can use, when you can use, who can sell, where can you sell. Okay, we'd have that with marijuana. We ha we're going to have laws about uh, public use, right? I mean, we say responsible adults in their own home. Nobody's going to use publicly. Okay, so I looked at public drunkenness because that's a big issue in some places. And I looked at um, DWI, driving while intoxicated, because no matter what anybody says, we love to drive. People are going to get in their car, whatever they're under the influence of, prescription drugs, alcohol, marijuana, they're going to drive. And those three categories only combined came to 2.7 million arrests a year that law enforcement made because of alcohol. Then I looked at marijuana-related arrests, trafficking, possession, everything. We're at 847,000. Now, I, I'm not saying that that is you know, a number anybody should be proud of. But when we compare it to our legal drug problems, I don't see how introducing something that would be more prevalent, and there's a great, you have a, the RAND uh, testimony back there, and there's study after study talking about how when something's more available and cheaper, more people use it. So, I mean, even the legalization advocates admit that there, yeah, they say there will be a slight increase in marijuana use. I mean, there's going to be a substantial increase in use. We can argue over how big that would be. Don't even need to do that. The fact is we're going to have an increase in use. There's going to be more than 6.9% of Americans using a legal drug. Um, and so therefore, I predict this number to go way up. Um, will it match 2.7 million? I don't know. I just know that they're going to, the denominator is going to be a lot bigger. So there's going to be a lot more chances to commit the viol law violation, to commit the regulation violation, to drive while intoxicated, etc. The next thing I'd like to look at Again, alcohol and tobacco are the only examples we have of legal drugs. That's what we have to draw from. And they're different. I get it. But those are our legal, in terms of an economic point of view, legal drug examples. Well, I looked at the revenue that we get. Because really, it's true that for every um, dollar of cigarette tax, the government, I mean, sorry, for every pack of cigarettes, sorry, the government in one way or another takes home about 60% of that. So you sort of think, wow, 60 cents we get for every, um, or sorry, 66% for every pack of cigarettes. That's pretty good. Um, that is pretty good if you only look at what you get to take home. It starts to get less and less and less good when you realize how much you have to shell out in terms of social costs to sustain the level of use that we have. And they're actually about the same, and it's interesting because they are there are different examples, and I'll talk about why they're different. They're actually very extreme examples on either end, and so that's why I'm confident in making this kind of um, comparison. What do I mean by extreme examples? Well, alcohol taxes today are $14 billion, state and local, federal, combined. $14 billion is a fifth, 20% of what it was during the Korean War when adjusting for inflation, if you can believe that. Our taxes over 60 years later are a fifth of what they were, okay? That's unbelievable. So we're at record low taxes for alcohol, and the U.S. has some of the lowest taxes on alcohol in the world. Why were they so much more back then? Well, we have something called the liquor lobby. <laughs> and I wish I could say it was an accident and, and that Congress forgot to increase taxes. I wish I could say that. Um, but that wasn't the case. And I'm going to get into what a legal industry will look like, but essentially that's the, that's, I just gave away the answer. Uh, $14 billion. And then we have the tobacco is the opposite. It's the extreme on the other side. We have record high taxes on tobacco. We are getting back at the tobacco industry for killing 500,000 people a year for addicting kids and costing us billions, trillions, and trillions of dollars in health care costs. We're getting back at them by taxing so much. All right, that sounds good, $25 billion. However, like I said, it pales in comparison with what we have to shell out. So they're each about a 10 to 1 ratio. Um, well, this is an 8 to 1, this is 14 to 1. You average it out, it's 10 to 1. Uh, we have, for every dollar collected in these two legal drugs, we spend 10 in the social costs. What do I mean by social costs? Productivity losses, employer losses, absenteeism, health care costs, huge. Criminal justice costs, the costs of dealing with this in the criminal justice system and in any system. Um, premature, the accidents that occur, the premature accidents or premature death. Uh, we could go on and on. The highway issues. Uh, we're at a 10 to 1 ratio for either of those two drugs. Um, let's go to the alcohol, then I'll come back to the other thing. So 
the the man so let's look at one industry first the liquor industry and i'm not here to rail and you know i'm not what's her name carrie you know hatcher you know about prohibition and, and i'm not here to right carrie nation uh, i'm not here to you know bust down rum and all that however we just need to be honest when we look at evidence so the evidence on alcohol is extreme is very very clear um, like i said the taxes are a fifth of what they were during the korean war and that is because and i worked in washington we have a very ruthless and a very, very good alcohol industry and liquor lobby. And they know that for every percentage of tax hikes, they lose customers. Because everybody is sensitive to price in terms of use. Even heavy users, by the way, even heavy cocaine users, heavy any substance users, are sensitive in some way to price. They'll reduce their consumption in some way. Um, we also know that the alcohol industry makes all of their money. They are profitable bec from the small minority of heavy, reckless users. The 15% of users who drink alcohol that do so in a very reckless way compared to the 85% of you who are responsible users, the 15% account for about 80% of their profits. So they have every incentive in the world to increase addiction and to increase use. They want you to use younger. You're younger you use, the more likely you are to be addicted, the more likely you are to be a heavy user, and you'll contribute to their bottom line. And so I really chuckle when I see these wonderful ads for alcohol, for beer, for example, that say on the bottom either drink responsibly or enjoy responsibly. Because if everybody re enjoyed responsibly, they'd all be out of business. All of these industries. Okay? They, they, don't, they don't make money off of responsible drinking. Not, not an issue. The issue for them is heavy, heavy, heavy drinking, young drinking, getting people young. And I just, I, this isn't again to rail against the alcohol industry, this is just, I don't see why it would be any different if we had marijuana legal. I, I, I just, you know, if this, if this was about, I went to Berkeley undergrad in California, okay? If this was about, as I was saying earlier, sort of, you know, drum circles and kumbaya and smoking a little weed now and then, yeah, I think it's a health problem, but I wouldn't be as passionate about it. Okay, it wouldn't be as much of an issue for me if it was really just about, you know, the aging hippies having a peaceful moment. This is not about anything having to do with that, but it will be presented as such. <laughs> this is about big business. This is exactly why the people who care about big tobacco need to care about legalization. Um, this is exactly why people like Patrick Kennedy, I mean, not someone to be railing against on these moral issues, as some people like to classify the, this as, doesn't see this as a moral issue at all, sees this as a social justice issue. Um, it, it's a major, major problem. Now, in terms of use levels, let's see if this works anymore. I don't know. I might have gotten very excited and pressed something. <laughs> Here we go. I got it. Um, so... Uh, you have the studies in the back, but essentially the RAND Corporation, which is as nonpartisan as you get, I mean, they have been critical of U.S. drug policy and law enforcement, to say the very least. Um, they did their own study on California, if California legalized marijuana. In fact, found that the price of marijuana would fall more than 80%, which makes sense. The price of illegal drugs are artificially high. They're high because it's, you've got to pay somebody for the risk they take to bring them in. I mean, that, that's the whole point of them being illegal. We want them to be expensive. Um, so that, that will be gone, that will be down. The consumption, therefore, would increase. And then they talk about tax evasion with marijuana. Much bigger issue than even with alcohol and cigarettes. Although I will tell you, one of the biggest growing underground markets in the country is the underground tobacco market. 75% um, of, of cigarettes in a recent study in the Bronx were cigarettes not obtained legally. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, and that's because it's not... Not only because the end user, it's not the end user going to the shady guy with the trench coat and buying cigarettes for, you know, that's not what it is. It's going to the bodega on the corner and buying cigarettes that you think are legal to buy from the guy who he might have even thought was legal to buy. But in reality, the wholesaler was the guy that, who goes down to South Carolina, fills a U-Haul up with cases of cigarettes at $3 a pack, brings them up to New York and sells them for $8 a pack. And the Bodega owner is going to buy from the seller from $8 rather than the guy who's selling it for $10. Or maybe the bodega owner actually does know that those are illegal, pays it cash under the table. It's a very easy transaction. Um, when you tax something, you're going to have these black markets. I, mean, I don't care what it is. But with marijuana, what makes marijuana much trickier to legalize is that it's just so much easier to grow. I mean, it, it, you know, it really is easy to grow. It's called weed for a reason. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, so, uh, you know, the last time I checked, uh, processing tobacco was, a, 
yeah, you have to know something about it. It was a bit of a difficult process. Not everybody can do that in their backyard. Um, you know, bathtub gin and alcohol, I guess you could sort of do that on a big scale, but that's not even, that, that, that's certainly not as easy as growing marijuana. So they identified tax evasion in gray markets as a major, major concern to any policymaker thinking they're going to be, um, you know, paying down the deficit because of marijuana smokers. Yeah. yeah. Go, it's sure. Well, what and do we have? We okay. I, I do too. So I'm going to finish with this. We don't think people should be stigmatized for their use. We don't believe in incarcerating users. They're not being incarcerated anyway, but it's important to get that out there. We do need to offer job and economic opportunities to people um, who are uh, involved in the illicit market. I don't think it makes sense to deny a college loan to somebody with a marijuana arrest record. I don't think it makes sense to deny them getting a job if you have a marijuana arrest record when you're 19 and you apply for a job when you're 30 and you can't, you can't get one because of that one arrest. I, that probably doesn't make sense. We've got to think of smarter ways to deal with it, um, whether it's not being able to discriminate against people with arrests, whether it's a new classification of the charge. I don't know, um, but we should be upfront about that. Uh, very quickly, Europe has not legalized marijuana, is the bottom line. Um, the Netherlands is the closest, and they've seen a threefold increase in youth use. They're the number one country in all of Europe for treatment need for marijuana, and right now they're completely reversing their policies as a result. 2,000 coffee shops five years ago, 500 today. 15% THC is average in, in the Netherlands. They're so worried about it, they're classifying 15% THC the same way they classify heroin. I mean, they're treating it much harsher than we do in the U.S. And this is their, this is their experiment with, with marijuana. Um, this is the stats about nobody being in jail for marijuana only. That's a myth. Um, I'm gonna, you know, another, another thing is that, sorry, it's highly unlikely that we're going to eliminate the black market for drugs by legalizing marijuana. The simple reason is these organizations do not make their money from marijuana. I mean, they make some money from marijuana, but they make their money from cocaine, methamphetamine, heroin. Those are much more expensive. And from other activities, human trafficking, chief among them, um, Internet crimes, piracy. I mean, the idea that if we legalize marijuana, the cartels and the gangs, whether it's the northern border or the southern border, are going to all of a sudden become, you know, milkmen, I, it just, it's not going to happen. They have, there, are, there are other things that they make money from. They will diversify and adjust. Um, so I'm going to finish with uh, two minutes on the medical marijuana aspect. I'm, I'm just going to get to the bottom line here, as I said earlier. Um, let's see if we have it here. Don't, don't skip too much. Don't skip too much. Okay. So uh, if people can stay a little bit. Yeah. Basically, we don't vote on medicine. I mean, I, I don't care what it is. I just think... Uh, just as a principle, it doesn't make sense. And the reason is, 100 years ago, we set something up called the FDA, which has problems. There's no doubt about it. It's still the gold standard for the world. It's still what every single industrialized country modeled their own medical system on. Okay? But we have that for a reason, so that the aspirin that you get in Maine is the same aspirin that you get in California. They're standards. Five milligrams for kids. Don't go over 10. You may have a problem. Um, 20 milligrams if you're this weight. 10 milligrams if you're not. We sort of, we know the dosage. We know this consistency. Take this as an injection, as a patch. Take this as a, you know, whatever, a pill. Take, r rather than, um, you know, smoke this burning leaf and we don't know the dosage, but good luck, good luck to you. Um, I, I, that's not compassion to me. Now, I'm going to address the compassion issue in a minute, but bottom line is the vast majority of people, and I looked at Maine's data too, the vast majority of people who uh, use marijuana in medical marijuana states are not the terminally ill and those with serious conditions. That's what it comes down to. That's about 5%, okay? And I'll talk about that 5% because we should not neglect that 5%. We should have compassion, and I have an answer for that. But 95% of the time, it's a general pain category, which I'm not diminishing pain, but just to say it's a ge very general pain category. And then we're coming to things like 44% um, in California were for stress, 41% for headaches, and 40% for exhaustion. <laughs> I definitely qualify for any of those three. I don't know if any of you do. Um, but, but, so, but the question is, how do we turn it from a joke? Because not in Maine as much. I'll give you that. But in most other states, it is a joke. I mean, the average user, 32-year-old white male, no history of chronic illness, history of alcohol and drug abuse. That's the average user in California. 88% of users, in fact, fit basically that profile. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't medical properties of marijuana. So this is, this is where it gets tricky. And people say, well, um, do you believe in, can, is marijuana medicine? The answer is not smoked, 
but probably, well, but it is in other forms, and it probably is going to be in other forms that we don't even know about yet. And why do I say that? It's because we know that there are components, we are talking about it earlier, for example, CBD, that can be helpful for things like neuropathic cancer pain and um, muscle spasms due to multiple sclerosis. So that's why I don't think everybody who says that they smoke marijuana and it's helpful for them medically, I'm not calling them liars. Um, what I'm saying is we owe those people who are actually seriously ill and, and are not trying to do as an excuse to smoke marijuana, we owe them a system at least as safe as our current system where you go to a pharmacy that's secure, you know what you're getting, you go to a doctor, you don't what you do in California, which is have your rent-a-doctor, you know, for $200, write you a recommendation, and then send you to some, you know, I don't know if we have any of those pictures, but, you know, send you to some of these dispensaries um, with, you know, the 500-pound bouncer guarding the neon sign that says cash only, of which when you open the door, there's a 25-year-old kid with no medical experience selling you super silver haze. I mean, I don't see how that's medical or compassionate. We should turn these into medications. Um, and in fact, we're actually on, our, on the route of doing so. This is a medication that will probably be available in the next one to two years in the U.S. It's been studied for 10 years. It's in late-stage clinical trials, and the name is Sativex. It's essentially part THC and part CBD. Now remember, THC is already in a pill form available, but very rarely prescribed, by the way. And that's called Marinol. It's not profitable for the company that produces Marinol. There isn't a mad rush to generic Marinol. I mean, it, it's just there are so many better cancer medications than Marinol. The other original reason for Marinol, by the way, was uh, AIDS wasting syndrome, uh, which is pretty much non-existent today. Because if you take your antiretroviral drug, you do not have wasting syndrome. And wasting syndrome is like a public health, talk about a public health success, it's off the mat. You don't even see it anymore. Um, so we do have a marijuana pill, like I said, Marinol, that is available if you want it, but this is going to be even better because this is actually the CBD. This does not get you high. The marijuana pill does because it's all THC. This does not get you high. It's an oral mouth spray. There's a proper dosage. And that, in my mind, is medical, should be what medical marijuana is. Um, and what I would say is, in the meantime, um, in the meantime, for people that can't wait one year, two years for this to be finally approved in this country, I think they should basically be able to enroll in a program with the federal government where the federal government supplies this drug to them or a similar, you know, you could do a similar oral compound. Because um, it has been proven safe and effective in 22 countries already. Um, and it's in late stage trials here. If you have a year to live and you don't really care if it passes phase four clinical trials at the FDA, have it be available knowing the risks and benefits. That's the answer. And, uh, you know, I, I'm actually trying to petition my old colleagues and other people at FDA to do that. Because I, I really think that that is the answer to this. If we're really truly concerned about the people who need it for medical necessity, let's just deliver it in that way. Right now, for example, in Maine, I, I, I feel for the state workers that are dealing with this program because they're in between a rock and a hard place. They are at the same time trying to carry out the will of the people in the state who, you know, you poll them and do you think people with serious illness should get whatever they need for their, uh, you know, terminal illness? Yeah. I mean, most compassionate people will say yes. The state workers are in a rock and a hard place because they are trying to, you know, deal with state law, but they're violating federal law, unambiguously violating federal law at the same time. I, I just don't think it's fair to anybody in this process. It's a great way to legalize marijuana and to go on that path. And that's why no major medical association supports smoked marijuana as medicine. That's why it's only supported and funded by the same groups that are coming here in 2014 and 2016 to fund legalization. So if you're really concerned about the terminally and the seriously ill, you wouldn't do it this way. You would do it in a way that actually makes sense that I presented. So I'm going to end. I'm not going to read these quotes, but you have them in your packet. They're simply the, the, the evidence that actually was, um, oh, that we were able to dig up about the tobacco industry. I mean, these are the same people that say we had nothing to do with kids. Um, you know, I got to just read one of them because I can't control myself. But, <laughs> you know, if you are really and truly not going to sell cigarettes to children, you're going to be out of business in 30 years. I mean, we have it. Every single major company, we actually have their quotes and what they said. I just don't want to repeat this for marijuana. And the idea that a state is going to do it in a responsible way without, with no commercialization and very control forget about it. That's not going to happen. You know what? The state does in a responsible way the lottery. 
and there are still four times as many lottery outlets in underserved areas than in white neighborhoods. <laughs> it's because we, I don't care if you're a government or not, you are, you're in the business to make money. And you go to where the money is and where the people spend their money. And so you put the liquor store, you know, um, five per capita versus one per capita in, you know, Compton, Los Angeles versus Beverly Hills for a reason. Because the people in Compton are going to go to that more often than the people who live in Bel Air or Beverly Hills. And that's why I get so riled up when legalization advocates talk about social justice and about this being about, about you know, racial equality, because it's, it's a real farce. Uh, it might make them feel good, but it is a real, real farce. It, it doesn't get to the core of this at all. So I will end it here. These are just some quotes from Patrick and David Frum that I was talking about earlier. Kim Richter is a researcher who's never been involved in the marijuana issue, but she's a hero to the tobacco, anti-tobacco field because she developed the most used and most effective non-medication for quitting cigarettes. She's on board to Sam because she doesn't want to create another tobacco industry. Um, and I would just say we have alternatives to legalization and alternatives to current policy that are not as reckless and risky. So I'm going to end there, I guess. Yes, I'm going to end there. There's my email. You can email me anytime. Our website is learnaboutsam.org. And uh, if you are on Twitter or Facebook, you could like us as well. Uh, learn about Sam. That would be great. So I'd love to take questions. I know I talked over time, but thank you.